tongue, it has an amazing ability to accommodate. Accommodation refers to the fact that it can change shape and allow us to see far and near uh, easily. And as we age, we lose that ability to accommodate. Um, some folks will say that the muscle is getting weak. And so that's pretty normal. And you know, children have a robust ability to accommodate. Teenagers are still pretty robust. People in their 20s have a slightly reduced ability to accommodate. But as we get into our 40s and 50s, it becomes increasingly difficult. And this manifests as difficult, difficulty with near vision. And so let's dig into that a little bit. What causes presbyopia to occur? That's, it, it is a normal aging condition. So there's the lens in our eye. And when we're, when we're young, it has multiple diopters of amplitude for accommodation. And we lose that. And so in our 20s and 30s, we still have enough accommodation that we can see up close. But the muscle is, or the lens is just getting stiffer. And it loses its ability to change shape as fast or as readily. And you know that lens, that lens change therefore in inhibits our ability to see near. So for someone who is aging and may start to notice some changes, what are some of the first signs that my sight might be failing in the matter that you're discussing right now? Sure, so with presbyopia, I mean, we've all seen this. So you know, you, you'll be at a restaurant and someone's holding their menu at arm's length. And that's because they can't see near and they're trying to hold it as far away as they can. And your, your arm is only so long. Another scenario would be someone who's str struggling to read their cell phone. They may enlarge the font size on their cell phone. And again, you can only enlarge the font size so much. And eventually, everyone succumbs to father time and you need some reading glasses. Father time, I'm quite scared of father time. <laughs> Is there anything that I can do to prevent presbyopia specifically? You know, if there was, you, you and I would both be very rich. So <laughs> it'd be a great idea if you could come up with something. Currently, there's nothing available that can slow down presbyopia, it is a natural aging change like gray hairs and wrinkles. It'll happen to all of us. It happens in the 40s at some point, some people in their early 40s, others in their late 40s, but this is something that uh, is just inevitable at this time. And so you're, you've mentioned sort of a natural decline in sight. So at what age is it normal to start experiencing this? The, the, the average age is somewhere around 44 or 45. But depending on someone's natural glasses prescription, some may experience it even in their late 30s or early 40s, and others may be able to push it off until their 50s. But the average age for someone needing their first pair of reader readers is maybe 45. And is presbyopia hereditary? So is it like if my parents have it, is there more of a chance I'll get it? Well, if your parents had it, it you're going to have it. But that's true of every family, right? So it's, it's, it, it's part of the human condition. So it's not really hereditary because it runs in every family. Right. But it, it is just something that's part of the human condition. So everybody will eventually experience symptoms of presbyopia. And what can I do if I am diagnosed with this? Is this something that I would speak to my family physician about? Or like, what, what should I do? Yeah, I mean, if, if it's something you get diagnosed with, nothing to be alarmed about, you see your optometrist, and there's various options, such as reading glasses or contact lenses, that can help um, address the symptoms of presbyopia. And another condition that we associate with older people is cataracts. Mm -hmm. And it's something that I, I've heard the term, and I've heard people having cataracts, but what exactly are they? Great question, and this is something I deal with every day. A cataract has to do with that same lens in the eye. So, you know, when you're in your 40s, the lens loses its ability to accommodate, but you're still seeing clearly. You may just need some glasses. Eventually, there's a breakdown in that lens, and there's opacities, so that when light is coming in, it's being scattered, and you're not seeing as well as you used to. And so, essentially, what I tell patients sometimes is you used to have a clean or clear lens in your eye, and now you have a dirty lens in your eye. And that light scatter can be quite bothersome to patients, and that's really what a cataract is. It's a, it's a breakdown of the clarity of that lens. And I do want to clarify for our audience who's watching, so when you're talking about lens, it's the lens that's naturally in your eye, and is this something that I can see? Can I see the lens that's in my eye? No, great question. So, so when we refer to lens, we're referring to the crystalline lens inside the eye. This is not like a contact lens that you take in and out. This is always in your eye. It's been there from birth, um, and you can't see someone else's lens in their eye. Um, it's in the middle, uh, middle of the eye. And just going back to cataracts, and even, um, I guess, presbyopia, is, well, like how common is it in the population? Is it something that everybody is going to get? Cataract is very common in the population. Most people um, in their lifetime, if they live long enough, 
will likely undergo cataract surgery. Okay. Although typically, you know, we start to see patients in their 50s and we start to see more and more patients in their 60s and 70s and 80s uh, with, with cataract. But it is very common. For example, in Canada, in a country of 40 million people, maybe, you know, three to four million people have cataract at any given time. And maybe a quarter million are undergoing cataract surgery in a given year. So not an uncommon diagnosis. And then same question with the press biopia. Is that something that everyone's going to get? Yeah, eventually, okay. you know, ev <laughs> eventually everyone does experience the symptoms to, to varying degrees and they dress in different ways, but it is, uh, you know, it's, it's not something we can evade. And so for myself as I am, you know, father time is hanging out with me a little bit. So how would I know if I have cataracts? What are some of the, the signs that I should be looking for? Sure. So with cataract, one of the earliest or most common symptoms that patients have is difficulty at nighttime, particularly with night driving. So they, they, the quality of their night driving is, you know, they're afraid. They're, they're not seeing street signs or bothered by oncoming headlights. We all are to some degree. Our vision is never the same at night as it is during the day. But patients with cataract are more symptomatic with night driving, for example. Or, or patients are having difficulty with their activity. So, for example, tracking a golf ball. Other patients may say, you know, I'm not seeing as well as I used to. They might go to their optometrist looking for an update in their glasses prescription, and that's when their optometrist may diagnose them with cataract, actually, and tell them that an update in their glasses may not solve their problems, but in fact, they need surgery to address the cataract. And does a cataract diagnosis have to come from your ophthalmologist, or is it something that a family doctor can diagnose and then send you somewhere? Yeah, absolutely. So a family doctor can diagnose a, a cataract, but not every family doctor's office is equipped with a slit lamp, for example, that would be uh, necessary to, to look inside the eye. So the majority of people being diagnosed with cataract are usually at their optometrist's office, um, or if they have an ophthalmologist that they see regularly at their office. But it, it would usually be one of your eye doctors who diagnose that. And what are my treatment options? So you mentioned surgery. Are there other treatment options for cataracts? At this time, no. The sur surgery is the only and definitive option. Not every cataract needs immediate surgery. So in some cases, patients may have mild cataracts that are not symptomatic or not bothersome enough to the patient, so we observe. Um, but there's no treatment for those patients. Right? It's not like there's a pair of glasses or drops that can fix that problem. When a cataract is visually significant, then at that point, surgery is the only solution. There, ha there have been studies looking into um, medications that can potentially slow down or reverse the development of cataract, but those have not been clinically successful to date. But, you know, w we never know what's going to happen in the future. And what happens to a cataract if it's left untreated? So cataract is actually the leading cause of blindness in the world. And so a cataract that is left untreated will eventually result in vision loss to the level of legally blind. And so in Canada, it, it, it's rare that someone becomes legally blind from cataract because we have such great access to surgery. But in the developing world, for example, uh, it is actually the number one cause of blindness, and, which is kind of sad because it's a reversible condition. Right. And, and how fast can they grow? Variable. So okay. some patients will have cataracts that they've been diagnosed with for 10 years and they've been slowly progressing. Whereas other patients over a matter of weeks or months progress quite rapidly. And so it, it is very dependent on the patient. And that's where we, the, patient's, the patient's symptoms come into the decision making process. If they feel that their vision has been going downhill quickly, then we do proceed to surgery sooner. Whereas if they say, you know, I'm, it, it is getting worse, but I'm kind of okay and I'm living with this, we can observe it. And so you've spoken about surgery, and a lot of times when people hear the word surgery, there's immediate concerns and fears. Mm -hmm. And so what are some of the things that you sort of walk patients through to help alleviate some of those feelings? That's natural. For, for many patients, the word surgery is scary. Some patients may have never had a surgery in their lives. And so this is, it's obviously very natural to be anxious or scared about the word surgery. What I tell patients is cataract surgery is very safe. It's the most commonly performed surgery in Canada. It's one of the safest procedures in all of medicine. That doesn't mean it's without risk, but overall it's a very low risk procedure and the outcomes are excellent. And what is a recovery time like if I was to get a cataract surgery? So the majority of the recovery following cataract surgery happens within the first week. So a week after surgery, you might be back to work, mm -hmm. you're driving, resuming activities, playing, playing golf again. But the full recovery, I usually tell patients, is a month because you are on eye drops for a full month following the procedure. So um, a cataract surgery, you're saying, will improve my golf game? 
I didn't say that. I just said <laughs> <laughs> I just said you might be able to see the ball better. Your golf game, I can't help you with. <laughs> so I was surprised to learn that there are actually different types of artificial lenses. I always thought there was just the one. So could you tell me a little bit about those types? Absolutely. So, you know, in 2023, we're in the golden era of cataract surgery. So we're so good at cataract surgery now and addressing that opacity. So, you know, patients come in, they're not seeing well with or without glasses because of the opacity in the eye. We're so good at addressing that, that we're also able to address other eye conditions at the same time. So patients may have um, other eye conditions like myopia, hyperopia, astigmatism, and presbyopia, and we can address um, many of those at the same time depending on which lens a patient picks. And what is myopia? So a patient who's myop myopic is someone who is nearsighted. Okay. Um, so they've worn glasses their whole lives. Uh, hyperopia, same thing. Those patients are farsighted and they've worn glasses their whole lives. And astigmatism is another reason that somebody might be wearing glasses. And so these are all conditions that have resulted in someone wearing glasses for the majority of their life. And at the time of cataract surgery, not only do we address their cataract, but we also address their refractive error. So you're able to insert a lens that will fix all of those issues while you're doing the surgery. Correct. Okay, so we've really advanced in that in that realm. It is pretty amazing. And for um, our glass wearing audience members, um, including myself, even though I really only wear them at night because I feel like they make me dizzy when I wear them, could you tell me about multifocal intraocular lenses? Um, and does this mean we can just get rid of the glasses once and for all? Yes, absolutely. So there's a whole, new uh, category of lenses, which are called um, extended depth of focus lenses, as well as trifocal lenses. Mm -hmm. And what these do is not only do they correct for the cataract, they also correct for the myopia or hyperopia or astigmatism that somebody has, and they correct for the presbyopia. So we spoke about presbyopia earlier, which is the inability to see at near. But with a multifocal lens, a patient can see far, so they can drive a car without glasses. They can see intermediate, which is like iPad vision, and they can see near which is cell phone vision or, or um, reading a book, for example. So these patients with, with a multifocal lens are able to see the full range without glasses and they've had their cataract fixed. And so we've spoken about this a lot in um, terms of cataracts, but is this also something that you could have these lenses, um, like use these lenses even if you haven't had cataracts, like do the surgery without cataracts? That's a great question. So there is something called the refractive lens exchange. And a refractive lens exchange is essentially cataract surgery for someone who doesn't have a cataract, but wishes to have one of these lenses implanted in their eye right. to achieve that. And so the same lenses are used for that purpose, but the patient just is, is pursuing surgery for refractive purposes and uh, not because they have a cataract. And how would I know if a multifocal lens is right for me? Like what's the right patient for this? Right. So. The best thing to do is have that discussion with your optometrist or ophthalmologist because there are patients who are better candidates for these types of lenses. Um, I think a, a good screening exam is very important to, to ensure that someone is a good candidate. There's a number of conditions that may preclude somebody from having that lens. But if someone's a good candidate, they can do very well with a multifocal lens. But I think that's um, a discussion after having a, a, a thorough eye exam. And how, if you have one of these lenses, how long do they last for? Is this a lifetime thing? Do I have to get it changed every year? That's a great question. The lenses that we use are um, essentially for life. So you don't have to come back in after 10 or 20 years to get it swapped out um, or to get it replaced. These lenses are absolutely for life. And so we know that provincial health plans can cover the basics. Mm -hmm. So the actual surgery and the implant of the lens, are there also other options? Yes, absolutely. So uh, we're in Ontario, but in general, the provincial health plans cover cataract surgery which covers the removal of that opacity, removal of the cataract, as well as the insertion of an implant. But if someone wants an advanced technology lens, so that's correcting the astigmatism, for example, mm -hmm. correcting the myopia perhaps, or certainly the presbyopia, that would be a lens that's not covered by the government and the patient would be responsible for um, the, the additional fee for that lens. And so what other age-related eye conditions are common? So we've talked about cataracts and we've talked about presbyopia, what else is, should I be looking out for as I age? Yeah, so in addition to um, cataract and presbyopia, other common age-related conditions include things like glaucoma, age-related macular degeneration, 
diabetic retinopathy for patients who have diabetes. Those are probably the, the top three other diagnoses we see in an ophthalmology office. And what is macular degeneration? Yeah, so macular de degeneration is a condition where there's excess deposits of abnormal material called drusen in the retina. And specifically, it's deposits of drusen in the macula. So the macula is the part of the retina that's responsible for your fine central vision. So when you're looking at somebody, you're placing that person on your macula. Right. And that gives you that fine central vision, whereas the peripheral uh, retina takes care of the surroundings. So the macula is a very important structure. And there's deposits of material there which are abnormal. And I want to dig into the age-related eye conditions a little bit more. Like, are there certain lifestyle things that we might be doing that are going to contribute to more of these issues as we age? For example, wearing a lot of eye makeup or eyelash extensions. Like, are these things that will make me more of a candidate for age-related eye conditions? Or is there anything we should be not doing to try and help ourselves as we age? That's a great question. So with respect to eye makeup or eyelash extensions, generally they're fairly benign. Occasionally we'll see somebody who's who, who's getting eyelash extensions and they accidentally got glue in their eyes. Right. And that can be a short-term issue. That can be very painful. But there's no long-term sequelae from that. Um, for, for, for someone with makeup, for example, occasionally there could be allergies. But with respect to long-term um, age-related conditions, not really. With respect to lifestyle issues for other conditions, things like smoking can be particularly bad. So for things like macular degeneration, um, cataract, glaucoma, smoking is a risk factor. And in general, maintaining a healthy lifestyle. So, you know, um, lots of green vegetables, fish, um, these types of things can be very good, especially for preventing things like macular degeneration. And what are the first signs and symptoms of macular degeneration? So with macular degeneration, because the deposits of material are in the macula, patients notice distortion of their central vision. And so, for example, they may see a, a, a straight line like a door to be a little bit wavy, or the floor may be a little bit wavy or curved. And they know that's not true, but they're, they're perceiving the image to be wavy. And we call this metamorphopsia. And so that's one of the earliest symptoms. Later on, as macular degeneration progresses, um, they can lose the, they can lose their central vision. So, you know, when you go to the eye doctor and you're reading 2020, they may not be able to achieve that line. They may be 2040, 2060, or, or, or worse. And so they're not seeing as sharply as they once were. Um, and this can progress with the passage of time. Okay. Um, glaucoma can be another common eye condition. So again, same question. What are some of the signs and symptoms of glaucoma? So with typical glaucoma, um, like, like um, chronic open angle glaucoma, for example, the problem is it's, there are no symptoms. Okay. And so it's sometimes referred to as the silent thief of sight and patients have no idea that they have it. Glaucoma in contrast to macular degeneration is a condition that affects your peripheral vision. And so a patient is not noticing that. If something affects your central vision like cataract or, or macular de degeneration, you notice it right away. But with peripheral vision loss, you're asymptomatic and you may be losing vision over time without even knowing it. And so it's very difficult for a patient to detect they have that because it only affects central vision late in the course of, of the disease. And are there things that we should be monitoring? Because, um, yeah, like you had mentioned with the peripheral vision, we're not always paying attention, but mm -hmm. is there any sort of signs? If, for, to, to the patient, it's hard. Um, and that's why annual eye exams are very important. So, so a screening eye exam with your optometrist, I think, is recommended annually. Um, get your pressure checked. So with, with glaucoma, it's one of the, one of the principal um, causes of progression is high intraocular pressure. And so getting your pressure measured. And you can also have screening exams like a visual field or an OCT, which can detect change over time. And so I think screening for a condition like glaucoma is very important. And I do want to let our audience know that you can put questions on our YouTube stream if you have any questions you would like Dr. Rai to answer. And I did want to go back to the annual exam because I feel like I've heard people say you need to go every two years, you need to go every one year. Is it every year and is that for a certain age group or is that everybody for your eye exam? Well, you know, sometimes how frequent the eye exam happens is, is basically a function of the provincial health plan. So, you know, coverage does vary. I think for a younger person, every two years is probably fine. But as we get older, and the incidence of these conditions goes How up. How do you define younger person? <laughs> <laughs> it's, it, it's hard, right? Um, 
I think once, you know, once someone is maybe 60 and up, I would suggest an annual eye exam for sure. It, it doesn't hurt to get annual eye exams earlier than that, but once we hit 60 and above, the, the incidence of these conditions like cataract, glaucoma, macular degeneration does, does go up, and so you're more likely to, to catch something. And the earlier these conditions can be caught, the better they can be treated. And something else I've, I've read about is that a lot of times your eye exam can also show other conditions that aren't necessarily eye related, but your optometrist or ophthalmologist has this view mm -hmm. like into your body that a lot of other physicians won't have. So could you speak a little bit to that? Absolutely. So, you know, the, as ophthalmologists, we like to think that the eye is the window to the soul. And it really is because we can see right to the back of your eye and your retina is brain tissue. And so we can see a lot. So for example, I have made the diagnosis of diabetes on the basis of an eye exam. Right. So I can see diabetic retinopathy in a patient. I've asked the patient, are you diabetic? They say no, and I said, well, let's get that double checked. And you'll, you'll notice that, you'll find out that someone is diabetic. You can also diagnose other conditions like elevated um, pressure around the brain, for example. So elevated intracranial pressure, mm -hmm. because we can see the nerves and the nerves may be swollen as a result of this. And so we can see uh, other, condi other conditions as well, like hypertension. So someone may have high blood pressure and not know it, but because we can actually see their blood vessels in the back of the eye and see the impact of hypertension on those blood vessels, we can make these diagnoses. So there's a lot of stuff that, a lot of diagnoses that we can make on the basis of eye exam. And I think it's important for people to know that because we often think of our eye exam as a lot of people is like, oh, it's just, I'll put it aside till later, mm -hmm. but my physical is really important. But mm -hmm. your eye exam really is just as important because as you said, it can pick up so many other things that move beyond your, your eyes. Mm -hmm. Exactly. I think sometimes it's assumed that an eye exam is just to get your glasses updated. And while that's a part of, of an eye exam, a full comprehensive eye exam would allow the detection of disease as well, in addition to just um, a, a, a updating the glasses prescription. Right. And we do have a question from our audience. Sure. So Maurice is asking, what does it mean if you have a hole in your macular? Okay. So a macular hole is a fairly r rare condition where the macula is, is nerve tissue and there's a, there's, a, there's a disruption in the continuity of the macula. And as a result, because it's in the macula where our fine central vision is, this can result in significant drop in your visual acuity. Mm -hmm. And typically what a patient needs in that scenario is a pars plane of vitrectomy. This is with a retina surgeon, and they can typically close the hole with great success. Modern techniques are very impressive, and patients who undergo macular hole repair typically do very well. Mm -hmm. The sooner someone has this diagnosis made, the sooner they have their surgery, the better their prognosis. And we have another audience sure. question. Um, what are floaters? Yes, <laughs> so floaters are the bane of my existence, okay? okay. <laughs> so floaters are very common. Yes. They're very annoying. I can see them and, right now. And you know, ev lots of people have them, myself included, and patients hate them. Yeah. And I, he I hear about them daily. Unfortunately, they're, they're a breakdown of the vitreous, okay. which is the jelly in the back of the eye. And when we're young, the vitreous is attached to the retina. But as we get older, the vitreous sort of contracts on itself and peels off the retina, causing a shadow on the retina. This is, again, an age-related condition. It's benign in and of itself, but the floater can be quite disruptive because you know, you know it's not real, but yet you see this in, imperfection in your vision. And typically what happens with, with time, patients neuroadapt and they learn to live with it and the brain tends to ignore it. But if you focus on your floaters, you will always see them. And so is there a remedy for floaters? Again, typically time. Okay. The, the vast majority of patients, just with the passage of time, they, they neuroadapt and their floaters become livable. In the extreme circumstance where a floater is not going away large, central, a patient can undergo a vitrectomy surgery uh, to remove the floaters. Okay, thank you. And we have another audience question. Sure. Could you explain macular dystrophy? And macular, this is from Farida. Okay, so macular dystrophy is a, is a broad term and it basically refers to inherited retinal diseases. And so there are patients who may have uh, a hereditary retinal condition that is typically um, familial and this can result in profound vision loss at an earlier age 
And so it's typical, it, it, it's similar to macular degeneration, but we start to consider these diagnoses, diagnoses when we have young people presenting with central vision loss. And when we start to investigate, we often find a family history of it. And so these are conditions that are, are, are genetic and unfortunately appear much earlier in life. And so I want to touch on that um, when vision issues show up much earlier in life. So I have friends whose children are wearing glasses at the age, you know, at quite a young age. Mm -hmm. I started wearing glasses when I was in grade six. So does this mean that I am more at risk for um, age-related changes or other issues as I age, or am I on the same wavelength as someone who didn't have those issues growing up? So there, p patients who have a glasses prescription they typically have one of three things, myopia, astigmatism, and hyperopia. Mm -hmm. So someone who's myopic, there, it does, that, that diagnosis does put you at risk for other diagnoses like glaucoma, retinal tears, retinal detachment. And so someone who is, and the, the, the greater your degree of myopia, the, perhaps the greater the risk of those things. Similarly, someone who's hyperopic um, can be at risk for things like angle closure glaucoma. And someone who has astigmatism um, may actually have an underlying condition such as keratoconus or pellucid marginal degeneration, which may be the source of their, of their astigmatism. And so again, um, these are conditions that need to be treated. So the pa patients who have glasses prescription, w which are very common in the population, right? Many people wear glasses, so I don't want to cause alarm, but it can slightly elevate your risk for some of these chronic conditions. And I want to um, talk about retinal detachment because I had a question forming mm -hmm. in my head as, and then I had one in my ear that came. We also have a question from Gail in our audience. So could you speak a little bit about that and what are some of the things we should look out for? Um, just because I know from when it detaches to when it gets fixed is a very short timeline before blindness can be caused. Absolutely. So the first question is what is a retinal detachment? Mm -hmm. So the retina is the neurosensory layer at the back of the eye. It's brain tissue. And so the way the eye functions is between the cornea and the lens and any glasses or contacts you might wear, the purpose is to focus light at the back of the eye onto the retina, onto the macula. And then the macula takes that light and converts it to a signal that is then interpreted by the brain. And so the retina is obviously a very important tissue. It's kind of like a film in, the, in, in a camera. Mm -hmm. In a retinal detachment, what happens is there's typically a retinal tear and then fluid gets under the tear and lifts the retina off. It's like the wallpaper coming off the wall. And as a result, patients are not seeing well. At the very beginnings of a retinal detachment, someone may notice that there's a curtain defect in their peripheral vision, or even earlier than that, they may just notice that they have some flashing lights or floaters. Mm -hmm. But once they get that curtain defect, that's a sign of an early retinal detachment. So what do you mean by curtain defect? It's as if there's a, you know, you're just not seeing well in this area. Like someone's pulled a curtain down. Okay. And I, I can see the t bottom half of your face, but I can't see the top half. Or I'm not seeing on this side of my world. Right. And th there's just a dark spot. Okay. And slowly with, with time, it may get bigger. It, it's not something that comes and goes. It's not here now and gone tomorrow. It is, it is permanently there and maybe getting bigger with time. And so that would be very concerning for retinal detachment if it's a, if it's a fixed defect in your peripheral vision may be getting worse. Um, the earlier you get this caught, the earlier you get this treated, uh, the better the long-term outcomes. And we have a question from Greg in our audience, and I have this question as well. Sure. Is there a fix for dry eyes? So dry eye is the other bane of my existence, <laughs> okay. How many so, are there? The, two. Okay. So, <laughs> um, just like floaters, uh, dry eye is something very frustrating for patients. Yeah. And these are both chronic conditions for which we don't really have cure but we have to manage, with, and there's, so there's treatments. So for, for someone with dry eye, treatment may range from something like warm compresses to artificial tears. And then for patients where that doesn't work, we may go to medicated eye drops or special contact lenses. Okay. And I have another audience question from Constance. Um, how, and I'm gonna have to ask for, <laughs> posterior cats, cat, I can't even say the word, but I feel like, Capsulotomy. Oh, okay. If you yeah, could tell, yeah, yes. tell us a little bit about that, how common it is. Yes, absolutely. So uh, what she's referring to is a YAG capsulotomy okay. um, for posterior capsular pacification. And I'll, I'll need you to define that as well. I will. Okay. I will. So when we do cataract surgery, what we do is we take the cataract out. So it's a dirty lens. We remove it from the eye. The cataract itself originally was sitting inside an envelope, a capsule. 
And when we do cataract surgery, we do our absolute best to keep that capsule intact because we need a place to put the new lens and there's no better place to put the new lens than where the existing lens was. So we remove the cataract and we implant the new lens into the capsule. But because we are using the capsule from the original lens, there are cells left behind from the cataract. And with time, some of those cells will replicate and cause a film behind your intraocular lens. Sometimes patients will be told that they have a second cataract or their cataracts come back. It's not that the cataract has come back, but it's that there's a film behind the lens. And so this is, an accept this is something we, as cataract surgeons we readily accept. We know that this will happen, but there's still no better place to put the new lens than where the original lens was. And if a patient does develop posterior capsular pacification, we have a very easy solution, which is an in-office laser, which takes maybe a minute or two per eye and can restore vision immediately. Oh, that sounds great. Yeah. Um, we also have a question about cataracts from Dana, who's mm -hmm. asking, if I have a diagnosis for cataracts, why wait for surgery? Why not do it right at diagnosis? That's a great question. So, you know, it, again, it depends on the patient, their risk tolerance, their symptoms. Um, not every cataract needs to be treated immediately, but, you know, when someone has an early cataract, some patients may not be um, particularly bothered by it. Mm -hmm. they, they just want to know why they're not seeing as well, but as soon as they have that diagnosis, they're happy to know what their issue is, but they're not so keen on pursuing surgery. Uh, there are risks to surgery as well. Mm -hmm. Cataract surgery, again, is the safest procedure in all of medicine, I would argue, but that doesn't mean it's without risk. And so if someone is, has a cataract but is doing well, they may not want to proceed with surgery right away, but once they're starting to become symptomatic, then it starts to make sense from a risk-benefit profile. And so essentially all cataracts will require surgery. You just don't, don't need to give them all surgery right away. Pretty much. I mean, you know, again, once someone has a cataract, they eventually do uh, typically undergo surgery. And what should a patient ask of their surgeon prior to going in for cataract surgery? What are some of the things that we want to make sure we know? Absolutely. So I think when I see a patient for cataract consult, the information I'm sharing with them are A, the degree of their cataract, um, how much of their vision loss I can attribute to the cataract. As, as an ophthalmologist, when I'm, when I'm seeing someone with cataract consultation, not only am I looking at their cataract, I'm looking at whatever other eye conditions they may have. So dry eye, macular degeneration, glaucoma, um, that may be contributing to their vision loss because those are conditions that will not be fixed uh, by cataract surgery. And so I need to know that and have that discussion with the patient. Um, furthermore, I want to talk to patients about their lens choices. And so, you know, patients come, in to, come into my office, but they've already talked to their friends or they've been on the internet and, uh, or YouTube, right? And they want to know about these special lenses that we can offer them. So I think it's very important that patients, you know, are well educated on lenses, um, both from their friends and the internet, but also from their surgeon. And they're offered, you know, a monofocal lens, a toric lens, an extended depth of focus lens, a trifocal lens. They're, they're offered, you know, all the lens options that are suitable to them. And I also think that it's important to have a specific risk conversation. I, I, I shared general risks of the surgery with each patient, but for each patient, there may be particular risks that are elevated in their particular case, and it's important to have that conversation as well. And what are some of those, um, are there any groups of patients who might be at higher risk who would need to be a little bit more careful? Yeah, so, you know, for example, younger patients may be at elevated risk for retinal complications. Uh, for example, you know, someone who's very nearsighted, uh, so someone who's highly myopic, may be at risk for retinal complications. Again, the risk of these things is very low, mm -hmm. but it's important to have that conversation. The risk is not the same for every, every patient. And we've been talking a lot about all the different eye-related conditions. So I, as someone, as a contact lens wearer who is essentially, I would not know the difference between you and Daria if I took out my contacts, am I looking for these age-related changes with my contacts on or without them on? Yeah, so your contacts correct completely for your glasses prescription. Right. And so when I say there's a degradation in your vision, I'm talking about a degradation in your corrected vision. Okay. So with your contacts on or with your glasses on. Right. Yeah, because if nothing's on, I have no idea what's mm -hmm. happening. Generally, generally speaking, what are some ways to be proactive about vision? Again, I think it's really important to lead a healthy lifestyle. So, uh, you know, 
lots of green vegetables, uh, fish, maintaining a healthy lifestyle, healthy weight, exercise, um, smoking cessation if possible, um, avoidance of secondhand smoke as well, and making sure that you get um, annual or semi-annual eye exams with your optometrist or ophthalmologist to have an early detection for any possible disease. So you've mentioned secondhand smoke and smoking a couple times. So does the smoke actually come in and interfere with my eyes? Great question. So, so the impact can be twofold. So one can be exactly what you just said. So smoke can, you know, the smoke that's coming out um, can exacerbate conditions like dry eye, but it's more the, you know, the effects on the body, right? And so, for example, patients who smoke develop conditions like hypertension. And similarly, any sort of vascular disease um, of the eye can also be exacerbated by smoking. So hypertensive retinopathy, um, macular degeneration, diabetic retinopathy, these can all be exacerbated by smoke. So it's not necessarily the, the smoke itself, but the, the um, chemicals you're inhaling. Right, and that makes sense. So going back to glaucoma, who is most at risk for glaucoma? I, I would say that in the population, the patients who are most at risk are probably those who have family history. Okay. But that's not to say that only patients with a family history can develop glaucoma. Uh, many patients who we diagnose with glaucoma don't have a family history. And so um, it's, you know, it's not exclusive to those with a family history. There are conditions that patients may have, such as pseudo-exfoliation or hyperopia or high myopia that may put someone at risk. Um, but family history is probably the most common easily identifiable risk factor. And I want to go back to being proactive about vision. Um, it's really a specific question. You did not mention carrots, because all my life I've been told that if I eat carrots, it'll improve my vision. And you said leafy greens. Yeah, no, <laughs> carrots are great for vision okay. as well, Ab absolutely. Uh, the leafy greens are, are very good as well, as are uh, fatty fishes. And what should I be discussing with my eye doctor in terms of what I should be doing at my age to, to watch out for these age-related changes to my eyes? I think the, you know, at your age, you're unlikely to have any of these diagnoses. Um, but what's important is just to get screened because at a population level, somebody will develop glaucoma early. Mm -hmm. Somebody will develop cataract early. Um, somebody will develop diabetic retinopathy. And so, you know, it's unlikely at a younger age, but you know, just to have a relationship with an optometrist who, or, who, or an ophthalmologist who can then diagnose change over time is helpful. And do you have any resources or places you suggest that I could go to find more information on age-related eye changes? Yeah, absolutely. So um, the Canadian Ophthalmology Society has a wonderful website, which has lots of patient resources. Um, there's a great website called seethefullpicture.ca, which patients can access and has wonderful vetted resources. And of course, to, to see your eye doctor, so to, to visit your optometrist or ophthalmologist, and that way they can examine your eye and give you personalized answers. So I have a question from Elizabeth as well in the audience asking, I am 72 years old and for the last six months I have noticed my eyes are tearing a lot and I constantly have to dab them to dry them up. Is this normal? So again, difficult to answer specifically without an examination, but there are eye conditions with, with, with age where t tearing or epiphora are, are, can be explained and essentially what happens is the normal pa we produce tears and the normal passage of tears is through a little opening in the eyelid and into the nose and the back of the throat. That's why if you ever take eye drops, you can actually taste your eye drops because there is a tube that's connecting the corner of your eyelid to the back of your throat. If that flow is disrupted anywhere along the way, you have a basic plumbing problem and tears will start to um, back up and may run down your face and you may find yourself constantly dabbing. In that situation, you need to see an oculoplastic surgeon who can actually fix that for you. Okay. So we've talked about a lot of the professions um, in the eye world. So when would I see an optometrist versus an ophthalmologist versus an ocul oculoplastic <laughs> surgeon, as you just mentioned? Yes. Um, you know, again, practice patterns vary across the country. I think for most people, their first access point is their optometrist. Many patients have a long-term relationship with an optometrist. Many patients have glasses or contacts that they've seen their optometrist for for many years. And that's usually the foundation of eye care. At some point, if the optometrist notices a condition like cataract or glaucoma or macular degeneration or uh, tearing, which requires an oculoplastic surgeon, they will then make the appropriate referral on um, to an ophthalmologist or an oculoplastic surgeon or a retinal surgeon for what may be needed. 
And so if you were to recommend one change, one step that people could take today to be proactive about their eye health at any age, what would it be? Um, I think, you know, just make sure you get a screening exam uh, every year or two. That is invaluable. And a lot of stuff can be diagnosed early and treated well. Um, late diagnoses are always sad to see because patients often have um, conditions that could have been caught earlier, treated better, and vision could have been saved. Thank you. So I think that's all I have for my questions, and it sounds like our audience questions have all wrapped up. So I want to thank you so much for spending time with me today. There's a lot that I learned in terms of eye-related changes that I need to look out for and how to be proactive. I'll eat more carrots and more spinach. So thank you, Dr. Rai, and you can check out other programs in our series simply by visiting everythingexplained.ca. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.